Well, good morning, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be back here at Coastline. I want to thank Pastor Neil, Pastor John, for their very gracious invitation to bring me back out for yesterday, which I was so, I don't know, I was so blessed. I was surprised so many of y'all came out for that. And uh, I, I thought we had a wonderful time yesterday morning, and it's a real privilege for me to be able to come here and to just kind of parachute in into the teaching you're doing through the book of Revelation and to take on Revelation chapter 10. But before I do that, I do just want to say briefly, thank you. Now, since I've been here before, and it's my habit to do it just about everywhere I go, normally before I speak, I just ask if people could remember to make mention in prayer for the work I do with the Bible commentary, especially the work we do in translating it. And I, I assume that I've said that before here at Coastline, and because I just want to say thank you, because I really believe God's answering those prayers. We see the work of translating uh, the Bible commentary just extend out month by month, year by year. We're reaching thousands and thousands of new people all the time, especially with the translated work. We're so pleased with the work that's going on and the progress of it in Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, Farsi, Russian. Those are some of the big works that we're doing right now. And so again, I just want to thank you. And I, I would not mind if you continue just to make mention in prayer. Just say, when you think of it, Lord bless Pastor David and the work of enduring word, especially the translation work. I would really appreciate that because I believe God answers those prayers. All right, with that, would you please open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 10, chapter 10. This is such a wonderful little chapter in the book of Revelation. Let me pray as we get into God's word here. Father in heaven, thank you. And thank you for this time, for this place, for this wonderful congregation and the way that you have shepherded it through so many years and through so much um, wonderful progress for your kingdom. Lord, I pray now that you would be a faithful shepherd to your sheep. And as we give attention to your word, that you would fulfill your promise to bless those who give attention to your word, especially the book of Revelation. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just start off. Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. I saw still... Another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. That's a very vivid description, don't you think? Mighty angel comes down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, whatever exactly that means. Rainbow on his head, face shining like the sun. Feet like pillars of fire. Now, we can get sort of a mental picture of that, but I, I don't know if you've ever done it. P please don't do it right now on your phone or device. But if you've ever, like, looked for artistic depictions of the scenes of Revelation, I've never seen one that doesn't look anything other than just really, really weird. Because people try to do the best they can with a vivid verse like this and say, I I'll make a picture, I'll paint a painting, I'll do some kind of thing that will describe this. And, and while I think it's okay for us to have some sort of mental conception of this, we got to realize we'll never be able to capture it in its fullness. John saw in his heavenly vision this very impressive, this mighty angel come down from heaven and of course, this follows right after what you saw last week in Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9 ended with the sounding of the sixth of seven trumpets, which were going to usher in the end of all things. Now, instead of a seventh trumpet, what do you get? You get a mighty angel and an interlude that's going to last until Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. As a matter of fact, um, 11, chapter 11, verse 15, that's when that seventh trumpet is going to sound. So even though we have a very vivid picture, I don't think we can fully grasp it in the visual aspect of it. I, I dug up, I found it on eBay, a comic book 
from Hal Lindsey's commentary on the book of Revelation written in the 1970s, there's a new world coming. And I tell you, if you think that the ones on the internet you find are quaint, you should thumb through a book like this. You know, it's all filled with just sort of crazy bell bottoms and patterns from the 70s. But whenever it tries to picture stuff from the book of Revelation, you see and you go, well, it's, it's hitting in the general area, Mary, maybe. But what this is going to look like, I don't think we can conceive. Now, what we ask when we take a look at a verse like one is we take a look at verse one and we simply say, who is this mighty angel? There are many people who look at this and want to identify this mighty angel with Jesus Christ himself. I'll say this, I don't think so. Now, I understand the arguments are saying that this is Jesus, because it's true, sometimes the Bible, in the Old Testament especially, presents Jesus as an angel of the Lord. These pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus Christ before he came as a baby in Bethlehem. We see that from time to time in the Old Testament. But there's a difficulty with that. Even though it's true, that word angel, Angel literally means messenger. And there are times when Jesus is certainly a messenger. Yet at the same time, there's so much about this that doesn't exactly seem to fit, especially because nowhere in a New Testament context do we find a clear presentation of Jesus as an angel. Instead, what we find in the New Testament is an effort to clearly distinguish Jesus from the angels. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, makes a clear distinction between Jesus and angelic beings. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, says that Jesus is greater than all angels. Matter of fact, later on in verse 6 of this chapter, this mighty angel is going to swear an oath by God, by him who lives forever and ever. And that sounds more like an angelic being along the lines of Michael, the archangel, not so much Jesus. Matter of fact, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, Michael, the archangel, is described as the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. So while I can't completely eliminate the possibility that this is a, a image of Jesus Christ, I think it's more likely that it's Michael the archangel. But whatever the identity exactly is, the picture is clear here. This is an angel who's come from the very presence of God and it's exerting their authority over heaven and earth. If you notice this, it says very plainly here, it says that he's clothed with a cloud, rainbow on his head, face is like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. But maybe what's more interesting than the identity of this angel itself is what he holds in his hand. Look at here verses two and three. He had a little book open in his hand and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars and when he cried out seven thunders uttered their voices. So this angel has in his hand a little book open in his hand. Now that phrase, little book, does not contain the same wording in the original language. Again, does not contain the same wording as the scroll that was held in the hand of Jesus back in Revelation chapter 5. The two writings, I would say, are different, but perhaps they're related. I almost wonder if that little book isn't sort of a shorter version of that scroll, which I would regard to be uh, the unfolding destiny of all things. And it's the portion of what John himself will see and write immediately about. This angel is holding open a book, I believe, that would describe how God is going to unfold his plan in the coming stages of the book of Revelation. Now notice, as he holds open this book, verse 2 also says that he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. This message that he proclaims forth, it's going to carry forth God's dominion over both sea and land. I want you to keep that in mind later on when you get to Revelation chapter 13. 
Revelation chapter 13 is a a chapter that describes a fearsome, God-opposing person that in the book of Revelation is called the beast. In sort of popular terminology, I don't think it's the best word to describe him by, but in popular terminology, we often call this person the Antichrist. This beast rising from the sea, and then an associate from him, commonly called the false prophet, arising from the land. Here, before that ever happens, God is showing that he and his word has authority over the sea and the land because that's where the feet of the angel bearing this great message are planted. And then when he cries out, notice the authority of this word. Verse three, seven thunders uttered their voices. We we see there's seven trumpets that announce the judgment of God. And here seven thunders speak forth a message. And what do they say? Again, this is the thunderous voice of the authority of God's word being uttered over this period of time. Now, what did those seven thunders say? I'm glad you asked. John's gonna address this in the very next verse. Watch this. Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. Now, folks, doesn't that drive you just a little bit crazy? John heard those seven thunders say something. He was about to write it down. He was about to write it down for you, for me, so that we could talk about it right now, a Sunday morning. That then he heard a voice from heaven saying, nope, put down your pen. You're not writing what those seven thunders said. You know, they say curiosity killed the cat. It also is the ruin of a lot of Bible commentators. People can't help but wonder, what is it that these seven thunders said? And I think I can tell you from all my experience as a Bible teacher, a pastor, a Bible commentator, this is my view on it. We don't know and we're not supposed to know. Now, now. It's a logical question people ask. Then why did God put this in his word? Why even mention the seven thunders if he's not going to tell us? You know how that goes. Somebody says, oh, I got to tell you this amazing. I got to tell you. And they go, no, no, I can't tell you that. (laughs) And you know, that just makes you, drives you crazy a little bit. You know, now you have to tell me because you introduced it and then just told me that you couldn't tell me. Why is God doing this? I think there's a very deliberate purpose in this. God is trying to keep us humble in our understanding of the book of Revelation and prophetic things. Now, friends, I believe the Bible makes sense. I believe that we can understand what the Bible says, but I think we also need to just be humble about what God says in the future. Yes, we try to figure it out the best we can. We, we, we search the scriptures. We, we, we do the, the deep work of digging in and understanding and understanding what others have said and written. And we bring all that together. But at the end of it all, we realize that there are things that we aren't told. And we need to keep that in a very humble place. We don't know everything about what God's going to do in the future. Why? Because God doesn't want us to know everything. What we do know, he's given to us to understand, and we should take that, we should embrace that, we should be good with that, but we need to be very humble in our understanding of what we don't know. It is such a good and healthy thing for this congregation to spend some time working their way through the book of Revelation. I I bet you guys are thrilled to do it together as a a church. And so as you come here week after week, and, and Pastor Neil and Pastor John bring you the word, drink it all in, learn the most that you can, but always keep that in mind that there are things about the future that God has not revealed to us and he has a purpose for not revealing those things to us. 
This little takeaway in these few verses, in verse four, and then the the word of the mighty thunders in verses two and three, and then John being commanded not to write, I think that's given to us for a reason. And we need to just come back and say, yes, we understand so much of what the Bible says, but God has deliberately said, I'm not going to tell you everything. Now, let's go to verses five, six, and seven. We read, The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be no, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, When he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Now, I want you to understand, here we have this same great, mighty angel standing on the sea and standing on the land. He, in a solemn oath, even raising his hand, he's swearing by the Lord in heaven, swore an oath, saying that there will be no more delay. There's absolutely no more turning back. I find a very interesting pattern in the book of Revelation. What you have is you have the seven seal judgments that begin with chapter six. And they come right up to a brink And then it seems to start again with the trumpet judgments. And right here you see, delay no more. It's going to happen. But then you have another interlude right now until the seventh trumpet. And then you have seven bowls after that. And what I see in this is sort of, without trying to sound too fancy, something of a literary device. The way that it's written is to make us supposed to see and to feel that God is extending his gracious hand to humanity as long as possible. You and I long for the return of Jesus Christ. We should. The watchword from the church from the very earliest days of the church has been this Aramaic word, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. That's our heart. I don't know about you, but I've had that attitude for a long time. Jesus cannot come soon enough for me But I understand there is a genuine mercy in God's apparent delays. Now, friends, there is no delay with God. He has a perfect timing. But we have to admit, on our part, it seems like a long time. And when we notice that, we understand that God has a very gracious reason. And that's why I see it structured here like this in the book of Revelation. God brings it to the brink with the seven seals, and then he sort of resets. Brings it to the brink with the seven trumpets, and then he resets. Brings it to the brink again with the seven bowls, and then the end comes in Revelation, finally, chapter 19. God suffers long. He suffers long for you. Now think about that, because I believe it's easy for us to presume upon God's long suffering. There are many people who put off faith, repentance, a surrendering of their life to Jesus Christ. They know, they know the truth. They believe that Jesus died on a cross They believe that he rose again from the dead. They believe that he was more than just a great man or a prophet of God, that he was what he said to be, not only God the Son, but the Son of God. There he is collectively there for us. They understand that. They believe that intellectually, but they have not surrendered to that. They realize there's sort of a price to pay with your life if you do that. And in our culture, that's not a price to pay with your physical life, but it's a price to pay with the surrender of your life to Jesus Christ. And they recognize that. They see the truth. They see the the cost 
that would be involved in them personally and say, well, look, I, I know this is something good. I, I know this is something I should do, but I don't, just don't need to do it now. I'll wait. I'll wait until I'm old. Now, when you're 20, you think I'll wait until I'm old. And you're thinking, well, I'll wait until I'm 30 or 35. <laughs> and then when you're 30 or 35, well, I'll wait until I'm old. I'll wait until I'm 50. And that just has a way of always sort of sending it down the line again and again. Now, that is so human. It's so typical of all of us. But I want you to understand how dangerous it is. God suffers long, but not forever. We should not presume that we'll have another day, another opportunity, another willingness to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, to get serious about following Jesus. We're so grateful that God suffers long, but there does come the place where what we read in verse six happens, that there should be delay no longer. It's been said, just sort of a preacher's cliche or story, but I think there's some real truth to it. That the devil's most effective lie is not, there is no God. The devil's most effective lie is not that there's no word of God, that there's no truth, that there's no morality. No, it's been said that the devil's most effective lie is that there is no hurry. Friends, there comes a place, a tripwire in God's plan where he says, not only for his great plan of the ages, but for individuals' life, as it says in verse six, that there should be delay no longer. That means you should not delay. Now, I want to call your attention to something here in verse 7. The angel says that there should be delay no longer, that the mystery of God would be finished. Now, whatever this mystery is, it says there in verse 7 that he's declared this mystery to his servants, the prophets. Understand something about the Bible vocabulary, the biblical use of this word mystery. When we use the word mystery... We're thinking of like a Agatha Christie kind of crime story. It's a whodunit. And there's some mystery about something that happened and nobody knows what happened and they figure it out at the end. That's not really the idea, biblically speaking, of what a mystery is. A mystery in the biblical idea is something you would not know unless it was revealed to you. So in other words, you could know the answer, but you wouldn't know it unless it was revealed. Here, it's speaking about something that humanity would not know unless God revealed it to us. And so what is this mystery of God? Well, you know, the New Testament speaks to us of many things that are a mystery of God. Things we would not know unless God revealed it to us. So the ultimate conversion of the Jewish people is called a mystery in Romans eleven twenty five. 25. God's ultimate purpose and destiny for the church is called a mystery in Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 3. The bringing in of the fullness of the Gentiles that in the non-Jewish people, that's called a mystery, again, in Romans eleven twenty five, 25. The living presence of Jesus in the believer is called the mystery of God in Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 27. And the gospel itself is called the mystery of Christ in Colossians chapter four, verse three. These are all things that we wouldn't figure out on our own. God had to reveal it to us. So what's the mystery of God here in this context? I think it probably refers to the unfolding resolution of all things. If we had come cold to the book of Revelation and had never read the following chapters right now, we wouldn't be able to figure out how things go unless God told us. Probably, most likely, it's what's in the little book that the angel holds in his hands. And I wonder, I wonder if that mystery does not also contain in it, because these themes are so real in the book of Revelation, I wonder if that mystery does not contain in it the answer to the great question, why does God allow Satan and why does God allow mankind to rebel and go their own way? 
The idea may be that this question, this unanswered mystery is coming to an end under the rule of Jesus. God is beginning the end of all things, the resolution of all things, the gathering together, the summing up of all things into Jesus. Friends, God freely acknowledges that today is full of mysteries, but it's not always going to be so. There will come a day when all the questions of this age will be answered. And we can come reverently to the God who holds the answer to every one of those questions. All right, so we have this image through the first seven verses This mighty angel straddling land and sea, holding the little book in his hand, proclaiming out with seven thunders. John's told, don't write those down. Now look at what happens starting at verse eight. We have a little story about John and the little book. Verses eight and nine. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. By the way, don't you think a little scary asking a mighty angel for that? (laughs) Give me the little book. And he said to me, take and eat it. It'll make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. That's kind of remarkable. First of all, that God told John to do something very audacious. Excuse me, Mr. Angel, may I have that little book that's in your hand? And then the angel says, what? Well, take it, but you got to eat it. I wonder if John's, well, you know, I just preferred if I could just read it. Thank you very much. John was commanded to take that little book and actually eat it. Now, again, this is happening in a vision that John has. But notice, because John was invited to take the little book, some people take this to say that God never forces his revelation on anyone. I I like that picture. God stands to you and says, hey, you, take this book. You're supposed to come? Okay, I would like to take this book. Okay, well, if you take it, you're going to have to eat it. You're going to have to bring it into your innermost being. You're going to have to take it seriously. Being adjacent or beside the Bible isn't going to help you much. You've got to eat it. You've got to read it. You've got to take it within yourself That's what John was commanded to do. Matter of fact, after the pattern of Old Testament prophets who were also given scrolls to eat, and the picture is clear, take this word of God and receive it into your innermost being. And so then John does exactly what the angel told him to do. Look at it here in verse 10. It says, then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Now again, in Ezekiel chapter three, the first three verses of the chapter, the prophet was also commanded to eat a scroll. That was the revelation of God's will for Israel. And when Ezekiel ate that scroll, it was bitter for him. Why? Because God had judgment appointed for the people of Israel at that time in their history. The judgment that would come upon them in and through the Babylonians. And God said to Ezekiel, If you're going to proclaim this word, you have to take it within yourself and you have to experience the sweetness and the bitterness of his word. I'm fascinated that this little book was initially sweet to the taste of John in his mouth, but then it became bitter within his stomach. 
And the word was simply this. Listen, John, this is bitter in your stomach because, verse 11, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues. You have to talk about God's comprehensive plan for all of the world, that God is moving history in a definite direction. This wasn't a message just focused on the church, but know about many peoples, many nations, many tongues. This is about God's destiny for the entire world. Not just one nation, not just one empire, not just one emperor, but the entire existence of the world. Now again, I'm fascinated by this whole picture of it being sweet as honey in the mouth But when he had eaten it, it became bitter in his stomach. Friends, there is something sweet about the word of God. You know, like many of you, I've walked with the Lord. I've been a Christian for many years, many decades. I've read the Bible again and again. Matter of fact, I've been in that sort of, well, it felt privileged for me to, to be able to invest so much of my time in really the study and the learning and, and the appreciation, the apprehension of God's word. That, that, that's really one of the main things that God has given me to do in my life, in my ministry, in my calling. And I have to say, I have found God's word to be almost incomparably sweet. It's almost difficult for me to describe. Because for me, delving into the Bible, it it isn't just learning a bunch of facts. It's not prepping myself to win at a Bible trivia game. Matter of fact, sometimes I, I lose at those Bible trivia games. Because even though I think I understand the big concepts in Scripture pretty good, If you ask me, well, which verse describes the second marriage of Abraham to Keturah, I couldn't tell you which chapter and verse. I could look it up, but not off the top of my head. So it's not about gaining knowledge to impress others. But for me, the fundamental sweetness of God's word is found in the fact that it's a place where I beautifully and powerfully fellowship, commune, spend time with Jesus. Jesus Christ reveals himself to me in and through his word. And I believe that Jesus wants to reveal himself to us. Now, I I believe that he'll reveal himself to us in many ways. I, I don't know if you've ever been in prayer either by yourself or with others. And you can have an experience that's almost transcendent. You've been in worship and it's almost transcendent. You almost feel as if you're carried away to a different time and place. Listen, I've had that experience again and again as I study, as I meditate, as I put my focus upon the word of God. There is a sweetness there. As the psalmist says in Psalm 119, he says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. It's as if the psalmist couldn't even describe how sweet the word of God is. So he says, how sweet. It's as if you don't even know how sweet it is. But friends, there's also something bitter about God's word. The Bible describes tough judgments. It describes hard sacrifices. It describes the laying down of our life to follow our Savior, Jesus Christ. It describes a a difficult path for us to walk if we're going to be faithful followers of our Savior. So they're sweet, but there's also bitter. You should thank God that you're part of a congregation where the word of God is faithfully preached to you, both with the sweet and the bitter. Now, friends, there are some places, some preachers, they only want to focus on the sweet and act as if there is no bitter. And then there's others who only want to focus on the bitter and act as if there is no sweet. The Bible tells us that there's both. 
And we need to be able to communicate both. There's a story about Charles Spurgeon, that great preacher of Victorian England. He was instructing a group of students in the ministry and he said to them, he said, listen, when you're talking about the sweetness of God's word, you you need to let it be reflected upon your face. You, You need to just have the radiant face as you're describing the love, the graciousness, the mercy of God. Just let your face be radiant. And then he said, and when you're talking about the judgments of God, the bitter, he said, then your everyday face will do just fine. We need to hear both the sweet and the bitter. Now, I'm not surprised that there are some people who notice the bitter parts of the Bible. I'm not surprised that there are people who see problem passages in the word of God. Friends, I've been doing this a long time. When I hear people talk about problem passages in the Bible, I'm always thinking, I'm rarely saying this, but I'm thinking, you think that's a problem passage? I can show you some tougher ones than that but I don't bring it up. They can find those on their own. So there there are difficult passages to deal with in the Bible, but you know what absolutely astounds me? It astounds me the people who can't see the sweet. I don't get that at all. I, I honestly don't. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Man, if you can't see the sweet in that, there's something wrong with you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If that's not sweet to you, there's something wrong with your so-called taste receptors. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. I could go on and on. Friends, I, I, I wonder, it's something. If you can't perceive the sweet in God's word, I think that's something to be concerned about and to talk to God about and say, Lord, I don't know if there's something dulled or dead in my senses, spiritually speaking, But while not ignoring the bitter, I want to come and see the sweetness of your word. I want to taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, like John, every one of us must reckon with God's word, its truth, its eternal truth that we must deal with. It deals with us. God has a plan of the ages. I I think there's some aspect of that in the little book that the angel held in his hand that God was commanding John to eat that was filled with both sweetness and bitterness. And that's something for us to grab a hold of, at least whatever peace we can. God's destiny, his plan for all the ages is written out. It's story. And in Jesus, we can find our place in the story. And really, that's what I want you to leave you with today. God has his plan written out, revealed. And our temptation in our humanity is to think of the ways that we can write God into our story. Okay, I've got the story of my life. And Jesus, you come on in. I want you to be an actor in my story. I'll give you a good role. Well, not leading role. Of course, that's me. But Jesus, you play your cards right. You can be best supporting actor in my story. Don't you see... That God says, you set all that aside. And I want to put you, God says to us, in my unfolding story. I'd rather have the smallest bit part in God's great story than have a so-called starring role. What a pile of ashes that would be in my own story. Friends, 
That's what God invites you to receive and believe. God's book is much better and that's the one that matters.